there's nothing quite as cosy as a farmhouse kitchen. One of Jane's first jobs every morning is to stoke up the fire and get a good blaze going. Jane and I make a good team. I've farmed this land for 26 years now. It's not that big, 110 acres, but it's a living. This part of Dorset hasn't changed much since Thomas Hardy used to write about it. Though I dare say the way we farm has altered a bit. Changes on the farm can change the landscape too, often for the worst. But I live here as well as earning my keep, so I leave things as they are sometimes. Though I could squeeze out a bit more profit if I wanted. I like to leave the hedges and trees where I can and I get a lot of satisfaction from the farm and the wildlife that shares it with me. But with a young family, I have to be sure that we can live off the farm. All the birds and other wild creatures seem to know the daily routine. They're always waiting for me every winter morning when it's up the hill to feed the cattle. All mud and muck. I give them hay and crushed barley. It's a very efficient cycle, really, all grown on this ground. And the cattle help to fertilise the fields for next spring. Crows pester the life out of buzzards, especially if they think they might get a free meal. I remember when buzzards were scarce back in the 60s. They say pesticides were partly to blame, but I reckon myxomatosis was the main cause. The rabbits were knocked for six, and the buzzards left without their food supply. Yeah, I hate the disease. But even so, we had more buzzards here in the West Country than anywhere else. Sometimes the best of the day is gone before Jane takes the kids to school. Francis is 12, tall for her age, and Tom's seven. <laughs> He's a bit of a lad, but he enjoys helping me about the farm. One day, God willing, it could all belong to him. Already they're both taking a bit of an interest in the wildlife around the farm. But of course, they don't really appreciate just yet how lucky they are to live in such a place. Though they don't see much of it at this time of year. It's just about dark when they get home from school. A lot of birds cash in on the free handout. Rooks, jackdaws and chaffinches pick up the spilt grain or just wait for the animals to finish and then hop in the trough. Cheeky devils, but I don't mind. They only take the leftovers. Red wings come to look for worms where the ground's been churned up by the stock. The chaffinches go more for bits of seed and such like. In a hard winter, this can mean the difference between life and death to them. Some years it seems that winter drags on forever, and spring's never going to come. One of the first signs of spring is the missile thrush. Before most other birds have even thought about nesting, 
it'll have chicks in the nest. If you go too close, the adults come storming down swearing at you. <laughs> I'm glad I can't understand missile Eve. Nearly had my hat knocked off one year. Living in the country, I'm sure I notice the changes in the seasons more than folk in towns. Even though this is a busy season for me, I always try to leave some time for just walking and watching. I always like to see the kestrels. They're useful on a farm, of course, getting rid of a good many mice. I often turn up a mouse or two when I'm ploughing. I plough in March, ready to sow the barley. There's always gulls coming in for worms. It's a real old scramble. There seems to be more of the black-headed ones than anything else. Reckon they do a bit of good eating leather jackets and such. The green woodpecker does his own digging. Spring seems to have arrived at last with the pussy willows and the blackthorn out. Farm looks a treat with blackthorn hedges looking just like banks of snow. I'm going to have precious little time to myself now that lambing's started. I'll be out every hour or two checking on the ewes to see if they need any help. Months of work finally show results. Well, it's exciting and a bit nerve-wracking, I don't mind telling you. But if everything goes well, it's only a few minutes before the lamb is on its feet and looking for its first meal. I can't afford to be sentimental about it, though. It won't be very long before these same lambs will be on their way to market. They might seem small and helpless, but they're a lot tougher than they look. The house is a happy place. It's always had a very homely feel to it. It's over 200 years old. Heaven knows how many children have grown up in it. A few blue tits as well, by the look of it. This year, they seem to have squeezed in through a hole in the guard. <laughs> Good luck to them. I'll have to clear it out and block up the gap when they've gone. Maybe I'll fix up a box for them next year. The yard can get pretty mucky at times, but it's good news for my favourite birds, the swallows. Every year they turn up in the squelchiest corner of the yard, gathering mud for their nest. Shearing the sheep is the most back-breaking work I know. I've been doing it myself for two or three years, 
Saves me money, and I know I've done a good job at the end of it. These old ewes aren't so bad. They've been done before and they don't struggle. They seem to enjoy it, really, like being in a trance. I feel like I'm running a massage parlour for sheep. The first-timers put up more of a fight, and it can turn into a bit of a wrestling match. Barn owls have nested here as long as I can remember. Sometimes in the evening I hear the chicks making a real old racket, hissing and snoring. It usually takes me a couple of days to straighten out the old back after a bout of shearing. In June, the barn owls can be really easy to see. The nights are too short for them. If they've got several young, they're out hunting early to get enough food. I've read somewhere that a pair with young can eat 2,000 mice of voles in a year. My father used to say they were as good as a pair of winged cats about the place. I know they're getting quite rare these days, what with old barns and hollow trees being pulled down everywhere, leaving them fewer places to nest. Never mind, if my old barn has to go, I'll make sure there's a box or something for them to nest in. We're all keen on wildlife, but the one thing my wife can't stand is bats. As soon as she sees them, she's off into the house. Thinks they'll get tangled in her hair. A real old wives' tale. Some of the noises we get around here at night are enough to make your hair stand on end. The old barn owl can sound like someone being murdered. No wonder it used to be called the screech owl. If you're not used to it, night in the country can be a creepy time.
in the hedgerow, little squeaks and rustles give the game away. Something is either eating or being eaten. A whole new set of creatures are out and about, like the shrews and mice, which I hardly ever see, except when the cat brings one in. Young Tom kept some field mice for a while in his bedroom. Until my wife found out, that is. We've got most of the crows here on the farm, even the odd raven. I don't mind the old daw, he's a cheeky so-and-so. There's a few of them up in the wood. They make a good use of the trough when it comes to ablutions. This year my kestrels have made their nest in an old ash on the edge of the copse. A branch came down in a storm a couple of years ago and it's left a hole which suits them down to the ground. Ash is a funny tree like that. It can look perfectly healthy, but it turns out to be totally rotten inside. What with the elms going and many of the big old trees being pulled down, it must be quite a problem these days for kestrels to find somewhere to nest. I once thought of taking out the old cops, but I'm glad I left it. I could have had a larger field, but to be honest, it's pretty damp anyway. Now I've still got a place to go and think and watch. A great spotted woodpecker's nest is hard to miss. And most years we get at least one. The youngsters could drive the parents round the bend, I should think, what with their squawking all the time. It's easy to tell the male, he's got a bright red patch on the back of his head. In a dry summer like this, rooks can't find much in the way of insects, so they come and lay into my barley. They can cause hundreds of pounds worth of damage, it's just not on. Time to put the scarecrow to work. Haymaking's an important time for us. If it's dry, it's all systems go. If it's not, I get worried. Pheasants and rabbits don't care much for the cutters. I often disturb a family or two, but try to make sure they all get out of the way. Sorts of things come racing out by the time I reach the centre of the field. Nearly ran over a fox last year.
The kids seem to think I cut the grass just for them to play it. <laughs> I remember doing just the same myself at their age. One or two of the old-timers round here still think that buzzards kill lambs, but they don't, of course. They can barely manage a big rabbit. But they do eat a good deal of dead meat, and this might have given some people the wrong idea. In fact, I think they do a lot of good, keeping down the number of rabbits. Buzzards do really well in the West Country with the woods and hedges and small fields. They're lovely at close range, sort of regal. Farming can be tough, but all things considered, I wouldn't swap places with anyone. I wouldn't want to change things much either. I love the place as it is. With so much to see around the farm, I'm never alone when I'm working. I could make more money from this land, there's no doubt about that. But it would mean more intensive farming methods. We'd have to grub out some hedges, fell the cops, drain the damp corners where iris is blooming in the spring, and use more chemicals to control pests and improve the grass. I could do all this, but I won't. If and when my son takes over the farm, I want to leave him the richness of its wildlife as well as a going concern. Then again, my daughter Frances might take it over. Who knows these days? <laughs> 